started playing, I think, I'm trying to figure out if it was 13 or 14, but around then anyway. Um, I used to call over to his friend of mine every Sunday, or Saturday evening, and uh, one day he was out and I followed him and he went to guitar lessons, so I followed him yeah, and uh, ended up staying there longer than he did. And um, the rest is history. Probably playing guitar about, I'd say, a month or two. And uh, I forgot something one day there and went back into the room and um, Paddy Harrington was my teacher and myself and his sister both teaching different classes. So they were sitting down anyway and he had the banjo out and they were just playing these tunes and I'd never heard it before, you know, so I was just blown away by it. So I um, went home then and was like, right, priorities changed here, so <laughs> I had to go getting a banjo then. It, it probably helped, you know, because you probably had the two to practice, so you try to get whatever you have to practice and one done first. So you can move on to the other one. Um, but I, I just like, I just locked myself up for a while playing it for two or three years. I didn't really think of anything else. So I'd say the guitar suffered a lot at the time, right? But uh, I'm making up for it now. Like with tunes and stuff, I learned them and then I forget them quite easily. So I kind of have to improvise a lot, you know? Uh, some people probably don't like that, but um, I don't like, I just useless at retaining the actual, the exact notes of the tunes and stuff. So I just find myself reverting back to getting out of holes and such. <laughs> well, before I started playing, I hated trad. I absolutely despise it. Like, uh, we used to do Tim Whistle in school and I used to bend them over my knee every day and just try to get my mother to write a letter to say that, like, he, there's no more whistles coming, like, you know? And then, uh, <laughs> when I started um, playing the guitar, then I just kind of started listening to anything Irish, I suppose, and that kind of got me into it. And then, after a couple of years, kind of, you know, blues and Rory Gallagher and rock and stuff like that. And then I kind of, you know, of course of it. So if you don't listen to any one thing specifically really, you know, kind of anything, whatever takes the mood. There's plenty at the moment anyway, between sessions and um I play like when, you know, with Trevor and Shane Scanlon and Martin Leahy or Ryan all these guys as well. So um we get a bit with that and uh, there's always kind of other gigs to be falling in with, you know. Like we do a lot of stuff for the Lee sessions but also like the City Hall stuff. The true Lee sessions we do a lot of stuff with that as well. So, you know, it doesn't have to keep going anyway. So, so far so good. Yeah, like I've been to other punk right now, most even seven to nine, just playing uh, in sessions. Um, I do a kind of a weekly thing to welcome in with Owen O'Brien on Tuesday night. Um, I'm in Blarney every Thursday with Owen and one other person, with various different people. Um, we play the Corner House then as well every month, once a month. Uh, third Saturday of every month at six o'clock. Yeah, so the fun of the thing was just, um, it came out of uh, the Russian tour thing that we had from the Lucas Patent and uh, like just as a result of needing another band to go there. So that's where it uh, was born out of. That was just, that was kind of a, a thing that was thrown together. Um, like we went to Russia first in 2012 and uh, did the Lucas Patent thing and they wanted another band uh, for, uh, was it October of that year? And I promised them I could get something else as well, you know, which I didn't have. So then they rang with about two weeks notice or something like that. So um, I just started kind of swapping sessions with Lisa Kenny with and she was in Cork. And uh, so I asked her and I've been playing with Barry O'Shea a lot and, and Nigel Gruffley as well. So we just, you know, we just said we'd do it and uh, put something together. But it came out very, very well for, for the short time we had, you know, and it went down very well over there as well. So, um, yeah, like Lisa's moved to London now and uh, Nigel's a daddy and Barry's doing sound in the Triscoll and all these things, so I suppose it's a thing of the past at this stage. And, like when we went over first to Russia, we didn't know what to expect. Like we didn't know if we were playing in pubs or clubs or halls or what. Um, so it was a, not a gamble, but we just didn't know what we were in for. And uh, it turned out great. They were all really beautiful concert halls and uh, some of them were old and some of them were new. And, um, but the, the audience were, like, you know, if you go to the States and play Irish music, the audience can be from their 30s into their 60s and 70s. But over there, it's like, they're teenagers and uh, up to maybe 40s, would be the oldest. Um, I was kind of curious, so I started asking, like, where do you got the interest from it? And uh, a lot of people, <laughs> Lord of the Rings, Braveheart, things like this, you know? So since they saw all these films in the late 90s and stuff like that, they kind of just started getting into the whole culture. Some of them don't like to turn up to these concerts and kilts thinking like that uh, it's just one big thing like that we all wear kilts over here and stuff but uh, 
But they're the, the nicest people I've ever played for. They're just so nice and gracious and um, try and go back in between the rest, like, so. Mick does all these things in very subtle ways, like he, he gives you CDs and stuff and he wouldn't say anything about it, like, and it could be two or three years before you actually get around to liking it, you know? But you wouldn't tell him you wouldn't like it at first. Like a lot of the old timey stuff I didn't really like at the start at all, or bluegrass stuff, and uh, I'd say it was only a couple of years ago I can really got it, you know. Uh, I still don't play any of it or any of that, but I um, really like listening to it now, right? And he'd, like, he'd often give you um, some stuff like Bellix One was the first time, no, the first time I heard of them was from Mick Daly, you know, years and years back, and you're kind of like, jeez, didn't think Mick was into this, but um, yeah, no, he's brilliant, he's got all sorts of tricks up his sleeve. You know, I got to do some lovely gigs in Skibbereen and all these places with him and, and uh, turn the corner house and stuff, yeah. Well, you'd be guessing now as to how long I have it. Probably six years, five or six years, I think. About that, anyway. And um, if I recall correctly, I was in doing electrical work in the shop, fixing sockets in the floor. And he uh, was kind of looking at me all day. There's this, and uh, there was another one, the Gibson Master Tone was up there as well at the time. And. Um, it was amazing the price of the Gibson was like 6,000 at the time, I think this was 1,500 or something like that. And as good as the Gibson was, like, if you were to compare the prices, there was no, you know, there was no comparison. Like, this thing was great for that price. But uh, I had a Grimshaw in as well, which is a very rare one. I sold that to Tim Casey a few months back. And, um, like, I kind of decided I didn't need it when I had this, you know. I just preferred this and, uh, yeah, it's, kind of, it's got that American sound to it. Like, it's a nice soft sound of it and you can play it for Irish stuff, it's great. When a stranger did so, uh, the Good Day Senor thing was just um, an album that came out of trying to document some songs they'd written ages back and maybe up to last year or something. Yeah, that was just this kind of a side project we kind of, I, uh, I had a load of songs kind of gathered up and bits of songs gathered up that I'd come up with and uh, I just said I'd better document them because I started thinking of thinking of songs and realizing that I was forgetting whole songs, you know, and parts of other ones and other. So I said I'd start recording them. And um, I suppose somewhere halfway through I decided, sure, might as well just ask a few friends to play on it and whatever. And uh, then it just kind of started sounding like it was like a finished product. So I said, go ahead and make a finished product of it. I did right. That uh, like that song in particular, though, um, at the McDaily, like that that he recorded a song called "The Crossing" years ago, Declan Sinnott, on it, and uh, any old time album, and uh, it's um, it's just one of those kind of border songs, and I loved it. Like I decided I have to write something like that, and uh, I was watching that all the pretty horses, which is an adaptation of Conor McCarthy book. And I said I'd write it anyway, you know, after that, with that kind of rough idea in mind. And as it happens then, after I'd finished it, I found out that The Crossing, the song The Crossing is actually based on the book The Crossing, which is a follow-up to All The Pretty Horses. So it's completely consensual, uh, that's where that came from. I, I, I could love to start recording right away again, to be honest with you, and I'm just going to keep going, but um, like it's just, it's just, it, um, well, it's some things they do finish, obviously, but some are finished, but uh, it's just time and money is the big thing, you know? Like, for a day in the studio is eight hours or whatever, and sometimes it takes a couple of hours just to get settled in it and get used to the whole process, like, so. Um, and then, like, say you've got things to do and bills to pay, so. Mm. It's not always easy, but um, hopefully, over the end of this year, I'll get something. I could probably do an ad band or CD or something, might be nice. Get that done. Now they're trying me. To be high. 